All right. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Random Thoughts Show. I'm here with Durham. Hi, guys. And uh, today we're going to be talking about all things AFL. Mm. Yeah, it's been a pretty AFL. I want to get that. There you go. Oh, my bad. Um, yep. Bad microphone work. That's all right. Uh, it's been a pretty AFL-y last couple of weeks. Um, so the most exciting thing was Ali Brown, one of our athletes being drafted uh, as the first player to St Kilda Football the Club. The very first St Kilda AFL women's player. It's pretty yeah. cool. And uh, it couldn't happen to a more awesome person um just just a great great human great athlete as well she's incredible yeah she's uh back and forth with genevieve for our gym vertical leap record yep. she'll take it then she'll lose it she'll take it again <laughs> uh and her record equaled the uh, past comfortably past. past so uh first combine she jumped a 61 or a 59 or something like that mm. which was just short of it yep. and she said i'm gonna beat that next time and yep. she added like five centimeters to her vertical yeah. in about a six month period so That's great she would have, if she'd gone to the combine, that it was around the same time. So it was November yeah, with right. an October combine. Mm -hmm. She would have had the record had she gone. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so excited for her. Um, yes, yeah, so we had uh, that, and we've just started a partnership with Almond Junior Football Club, which is very exciting. Very so exciting. We, we kicked that off. Um, I had the pleasure of delivering some stuff to the coaches on Sunday, but also having uh, Rob McCartney, um, who is the Football Operations and Strategy Manager for Hawthorne Football Club. That's a very fancy title, that is. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a, uh, you know, he's very impressive. Um, and it was really interesting getting to hear um, all about the stuff they do there. Um, so, yeah, we thought might, might chat footy. So, Orman got pretty lucky there, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> so, his kids play there. <laughs> Just got uh, some pro bono just, AFL high performance just, work there. You know, arguably the greatest head coach in the history of the AFL. Um, yep. You know, knows the ins and outs of all that stuff. So, very cool. Um, lot of, and so it was really interesting how he was talking about just structuring training and structuring training. Um, and I won't go into this too much because it's not our area. Um, but structuring training into if you've got an hour's training, making it four quarters. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that concept before where you do like sort of stations almost. And that's what we did when I was back at Oakley. Yeah. Is they would do stations where it's like yeah. quarter based stations. Yeah. Mm, um, but they would all do the same thing. So you have. Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. So, Ugly was probably more a logistics thing where they'd yeah. have to break their groups up. But with smaller teams, you could. With smaller teams. And, and, and you can build to it better. So, you can have um, a bit of unstructured stuff. You can have structured skill development. And then you can have um, team play. And you could you, you have it all work out. Progressively structured. Yeah. yeah it was nice. very interesting. It was really good. Um, but, yeah. So, back to our end. Let's get back, back in the gym. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we, I love preparing AFL footy players. I just love footy in general. Yeah. It's such a great sport. It's just great. It's because it's, it's the ultimate, I think it's the ultimate challenge for, from a team sport point of view in the sense that there's so many disparate qualities that you are trying to bring together into one athlete. Yeah. Um, you were talking about it before. I like how you, you were yeah. talking about AFL footballers need to simultaneously, they need to be rugby players. They need to be able to wrestle. They need to be, you know, MMA fighters. They need to be soccer players. But they need to be as explosive as a basketball or a volleyballer. Yeah. They need to have the conditioning of a middle distance guy, but also have the speed of a sprinter. They just need to have all these different qualities, all these different traits. Yeah. All at the same time. Yeah. And the kicking introduces such a different thing as well uh, in terms of, of, you know, if you're custom designing something to stress out. Uh, your hamstrings and your groins yep you know um yeah it's really interesting um and we've trained a lot of afl players a lot of footy players over the years um and they've gone pretty well um mm. i think our our way of doing it works quite nicely uh, we've learned a bit through through the sport as well yep um let's chat about you know how we do it and what you should what are the priorities are where do you want to start do we, do we want to God, start it's such a big topic I, broad I've, or do we want to go conditioning or injuries can i confess i've never felt more unsure of where to start when talking about a thing yeah. um but i guess you always have to come Cause, back because it goes back to that point of so many qualities everything's important mm. oh we need to worry about conditioning but we need them to be strong but we need them to mm. be you know robust and there's I so think, many factors i think the starting point though is um is structural integrity like if if you aren't uh healthy and whole you can't do any of those other things staying robust yeah being, being durable yeah, yeah bulletproofing um, so I think that's probably the most interesting part, the most relevant part to start with. Unfortunately, the most interesting though. I'm going to have to argue yeah, on that one. I think you're probably right. Um, but it is, but it is like, because so much of strength and conditioning, so much of athletic development, if you just stay fit, if you just yeah. don't get, if you get through an entire 22 game season or 18 round season and don't get hurt, that was a win. That was, that was a That means you could play every game, you showed up to every training, you got all that work done and you'll be fitter and stronger at the end for having just got through all that work. Mm. But you've got to do it and, and have the performance. I think, mm. I think, 
you know, if we look at um, that period for North Melbourne Football Club where they had the lowest injury rate in the history of the competition, but they didn't win and no one. Oh, yeah, st- still have to be pushing for wins. But yeah. but step one is... Step, step one to think about is... Yeah. And it's not to say you would do that before you worry about performance and, and power and adaptations mm. like that. You're doing these things simultaneously. Mm. But if you're neglecting that part, that tissue quality, that robustness, yeah. if you're neglecting that, it makes the rest... Yeah, sometimes tricky. people question me on it on, and they'll, they'll say... Um, Oh, you know, so when are you going to start doing the performance stuff? It's like, no, it's it's the performance and the bulletproofing. They're all the same. It's all part of the same process. It's not like you you wait six months. Oh, we've now completed your bulletproofing. We will commence. <laughs> we'll stop doing that and we'll start doing the next part. No, it's yeah. all running at the same time. Yeah. yeah, it's all operating at the same time. Exactly. Um, so I think the first thing is uh, attending to tissue quality. Mm-hmm. So um, do you have the mobility? And we've talked about that heaps before, so we don't need to go into that. But I think the specific tissue quality things that you want to chase for um, for footy players. Um, and the biggest trends in the sport uh, in terms of soft tissue are um, hamstring tears, Hamstrings calves. Big. Calves, um, especially in the older players as groin, well. Yep. Groin injuries. Um, and I think hamstrings is hamstrings are an injury where we understand so much more than we did five, ten years ago. It's been yeah, so five, much. I reckon five. I reckon the last five years... Yeah. In the time since I've been here at Court Advantage, the level of understanding around different things mm. has just shot up. Mm. And so I like the approach of uh, of a dose of time under tension, of actually getting a bit of uh, a bit of lower level stress for a longer duration time into the hamstrings. Yep. Think um, of just building general capacity. Yeah, just yeah. Generally getting those muscles to activate under load. To, to work, yep. yeah. Uh, and so there's, there's a, a bunch of different ways you can do that. You can do um, simple little isometric um, lying curl yeah, like, with a, like a hamstring machine type thing or yep. ca- with cables yep yep um and you can also do the uh, uh the bridge i think that's a really good one for people to do in uh, they don't have equipment specifically the straight, the leg, straight bridge. leg bridge yeah, yeah. Where, where you've got your heels up on a bench or a box or mm. something and then you just lift your heels so you're like from ankle to shoulder in a straight line with your butt in the air and really it's just a, another kind of it's kind of like a back plank with a leg emphasis isn't it like you're working that posterior that whole posterior yeah, it's, chain it's that it's that you've got glute bridges you've got a back plank for your posterior chain then you've got mm. a straight leg bridge to get mm. it more emphasized on the hammies mm. yeah mm-hmm. um and so if you if you do that and then you can progress into actual um the the and we've talked about this in another podcast the nordics yeah we talked about hamstring at length those two episodes yeah, so will, be, will be linked with this one dive into yep. those um but pro- progressively easing into a nordic program Yep. Um, I think people can uh, overcook the. I think a lot of the time they they get scared of them because they think it's like kind of this like it's like you're making someone dive from a, a twenty meter platform on day one. It's like, mm. No, you can just just kind of step into the water. Yeah, there's just, every every football athlete you have should be on some form of Nordic progression continuum. They should be on the way towards yeah. Nordics. And even if that even that that on the way is doing the isometric cable curl things and the straight leg bridges yeah. stuff. That's that's part of the continuum. That's a blog post we really should write as well as our, our Nordic yeah. continuum. We'll mm-hmm. get to that one day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but if you do that, I think um, if you can attend to that and just really gradually bring them along and then once you're actually at the Nordic, uh, I think one of the best things is just like starting with a really, really sub-maximal Nordic where you're making most of the catch with your hands. Yeah, where well, you break early. Yeah. And, and you, you're sort of like just, and we're done. Let it go real fast. Yeah. yeah. Um, You've lost your train of thought. No, no, I haven't. It's just that your language was doubly confusing on both those sentences. So I'm going to take it the wrong way. Extrapolate, expand. Because um, when you said break early, because Nordic is a breaking exercise. So you mean give, what you meant is like, Tip over and just let it go. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so let, let let yourself yep. give. So don't hold on. Don't hold on for dear life. Yep. Just let yourself fall smoothly. Yeah. Is what yep, I meant. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so the way I describe it to athletes is the first time is um, when you're really good at a Nordic, you are actually letting your body drop and you're catching it with your mm-hmm. hamstrings. Yep. And they're acting as a brake to fight that gravity. Um, but in the early days, you want to catch it mostly with your pecs. Yeah. Make it make it an eccentric push up as much <laughs> yeah. as an eccentric hamstring yeah, exercise. Yeah. And then just gradually. Ch- change that percentage so the first time you do it it might be um 10 hamstrings 90 percent pecs so, so it's a push-up catch effectively and you're just shifting and, that ratio yeah, yeah. yeah yep um and there's other ways you can do it if, you, if you've got athletes that you are not confident that they can and <laughs> make the catch well they're not confident they can make the catch or that they have the discipline and judgment to not overdo it yeah com- competition becomes a big thing it's mm. like oh look he got a little further than me well i'm gonna try yeah. and catch him yeah, yeah. Or her. Yep. uh so i think uh the the swiss ball version of it as well where you just you know it's kind of like you're doing a swiss ball push-up but with the nordics 
uh, involved as well. Yeah, so you set up as a regular Nordic, mm. you have a Swiss ball in front of yourself and you just sort of gently you know, use your arms the entire way down and mm. use the Swiss ball to control your position. And the mm. beauty of the ball is you can sort of move it out a little further as you get a little further down mm. and, and increase the range of motion mm. that way. Um, uh, and the why, the why of it, of why you should do the Nordics really quickly um, is that you're getting a this super maximal stress. So it's a stress that's above that which your hamstrings can cope with. Um, is giving you an architectural adaptation in the muscle, which makes it much less likely to tear. Yep. So it's a big why. Increasing fascicle length, increasing eccentric force production, and increase uh, reducing rather that pination angle. Mm. So the fibers of your hamstrings actually change their angle and it's move crazy. into a position where they're biomechanically advantaged, and so they become yeah. they become longer and stronger. Yeah. And able to deal with those loads of high speed running. Crazy. Yeah. So, so to not do something to attend to that, I, I think is is nuts. Like it, mm. it's such a good opportunity, and it's an it's a no equipment opportunity. If you've got a cushion and a teammate who can who can hold the ankles, yeah, um, you, you can start, and you've got healthy shoulders, so you can do that that push up catch. Yeah, uh, you can start really easy. And a great place to do it is uh, at the end of training, mm. before you do your cool down. So finish training. Yeah. Get a couple of sets in there. Once your once your team is up to that progression, yep. don't just jump straight. Assume, don't assume they're healthy. In. Yeah, assuming they're healthy, assuming they're going well. Adding in just a set or two of that at the end of training mm-hmm. is is an often way way of uh, junior clubs will get that into their and athletes. the minimum effective dose. So one of our uh, coaches here, um, Argel, uh, has been heavily involved in all the, the research there at the ACU, working with the uh, um, David Opar and, Opar's and Timmons group, group. And, yep. and Timmons. Um, and the minimum effective dose they're looking at is I think was it two two fives. Two fours, fours? Like, something tiny, like eight, eight to ten reps a week, once a week, exactly. Yeah. Crazy low volume, yeah. Um, to get to get a bit of a change, yeah. Um, so that's hamstrings. So there's there's heaps you can do in terms of getting the muscles themselves better. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also the neural component. I think people underestimate the the neural, the element. sciatic nerve side of things. Yeah, so keeping the nerves just happy. Uh, and I reckon that's twofold. I think part of that is um, not smashing them with absurdly heavy weights. Yeah, especially in season. Yeah. Going crazy heavy on your deadlifts on the day of training. Mm. Yeah. Not ideal. Not ideal. Uh, I still think you should be proper strong. I think there's for a while there was this trend where it was, um, oh, let's let's do almost no axial load strength, no bilateral strength. I think you should be proper strong. I think it should be one somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 times body weight. It's probably yep. the sweet spot for most people. I, I would agree with that, yep. And maybe even a little higher for the athletes that can If they can do it really well. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... so Controlling your load in terms of that axial load so you're not overstressing them and actually tightening up the side X import, not messing up with the SIJ. I mean, that's what Steve Saunders' biggest contribution, I reckon, in many ways with North Melbourne's program because he was the high-performance manager there, yep. was um, that he didn't like, – A, he attended to soft tissue quality and, and time and attention. And, time and, like attention and he attended to the software element of your core. But also he just didn't let them mess up SIJs and sciatic nerves them, and discs because they weren't doing axial load. Didn't go too aggressively on the on the weights and so didn't yeah. go too deep or anything mm. like that. Yeah, mm, That's interesting. Um, so if you're doing those things, I think you've done a pretty good job of keeping your hamstrings healthy. And then you want to make sure that you're attending to groin uh, issues. Which I think in order to keep moving along the topics, I think we can just link straight to our adductor episode, which we covered I think three or four episodes ago. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, yeah we talked um, about it. Uh, and we've even got a, an accessory video linked to the Copenhagen. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. How, how to do the Magnus Band Bridge, how to do the Copenhagen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all the stuff adductor related is there. And all I will say is do that stuff. It's magic. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. It's an area that, uh, so OP, um, they've done a great job in the last probably 20 years with adductors, I reckon, mm. of it used to be that a, OP was like a death sentence. For yeah. Football. Oh, I've got OP, that's 12 months out. It was, it was, it was yeah. really ca- catastrophic injury. And what they found was, and through the, the research they did, was that groin strength would drop before that would that yeah. that symptom would precede having pain mm. in the adductors and in yeah. the groin and so athletes would do this squeeze test on a monday and if you were down two weeks in a row they would deload you and they'd back off your training and do extra it's rehab a really work. good early red flag and yeah. so they could really quickly very early go uh, you're you know a week or two away from having an adductor problem mm. or an op problem and so they just would deload these players mm. maybe rest them a week or reduce their minutes or their training volumes and they could sidestep that injury mm. so easily mm. Um, and so the Copenhagen work, the Magnus Band Bridge helps keep you strong and stable through mm. that area because it's such a big deal. The adductors and we're learning more and more every every year. I feel like every month with yeah, adductors, yeah. it's so important with that glute med force couple when it comes mm. to running and your stance leg when you kick. Yeah. So the ability for your glute med, your glute max, and your adductor group to work together to keep the hips stable as we sprint at stop speed, as we change direction, as we kick, is so important. And if we're weak through there and we're constantly overloading that mm. area through instability 
creates some serious problems. Mm. Um, it's interesting. One one thing that's fallen off the radar a little bit. What you just reminded me we we're talking about the glute med uh, is the idea that if your glute med is really weak, your pelvis will be unstable. Therefore, your adductor will have to work too hard. And it'll be overworked during stance in a way that it can't really cope with. Because it's trying to make up both sides of the force couple. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's worth talking also about glute med. Mm. Um, so you want to, So glute med is one of the most important muscles you own. It's the one that prevents your um, femur, your knee from caving in in, in a large way. Into a position we call valgus, mm. where the knee's tucked um, in towards the midline. And so a, a little bit of glute med work with some bands, I think... Um, Sometimes people, sometimes people have a straight out groin problem where it's just an adductor problem, and it was just the adductor was weak. But I think so often what they've actually got is they've got a glute max and glute med problem with an adductor symptom. Yeah, so the deficiency is somewhere else that's causing yeah. a flow on effect somewhere else. Yeah, and so that's not to say you should not train the adductors because you should probably go well. We'll we'll have some success addressing the deficiency, but you're not going to completely fix that pattern. Mm, yeah. So you kind of want to attack the problem from both ends. Definitely. So yeah. symptomatic, but also root cause. So I'll also link. There's going to be plenty of resources. <laughs> so this, many links because this this podcast is really a tie together of a whole bunch of other stuff we've done in yeah. the past. Yeah. And so I'll link to our our adductor episode, mm. our multiple hamstring episodes, and also we've got a blog article talking about glute meds and how to train glute meds. So. Is that my ye oldy one? No, it's my Yoldi one. Is it? <laughs> your, okay. Well, I'll, so actually reminds me. I'll also link to Durham's Yoldi one about about glute max okay, and the cool. importance of glute max. I don't even want to look at that eye because it's so old. I think to to wrap up on tissue quality, one mm. last thing I think that ties in nicely with hamstrings and adductors is uh, hip flexibility. Mm. So your hip flexors, hip flexor flexibility, yep. is going to influence your glute max strength and activation. Your pelvic alignment, your anterior yep. or posterior pelvic yep. tilt of the hem, of the of the pelvis, which will in turn help deload and allow the hamstrings and the adductors mm. to do their job from a better biomechanical position. Just, just in a good spot. Are you old enough to remember Matthew Richardson from Richmond? Yeah. Okay. Love Richo back in the day. I wasn't uh, a Richmond supporter, but I loved when he moved to the wing. And yeah. He stopped playing forward and they got, got him up on the ball. Yeah. Great for super coach. Um, so he was a classic anterior tilt pelvis mm. and he had a lot of hamstring Like a duck issues. butt running around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that was a good example of that of where you, that pelvis is tilted over. Your hamstrings are just... A, they're just they're just more lengthened in resting. You just just standing around, they've got more tension on them, which is going to affect the sag nerve again, like we mm. mentioned. Yep. Um, but B, your glutes just can't operate that well when you're in that, that position. Try it. Try and try and um try and really tilt the pelvis, not running fast, <laughs> but try and tilt it a bit and then try and run. You just doesn't work loads up your lower back mm. lengthens out your hamstrings puts you in a bad position yeah, yeah. so not only is it in opening up increased injury risk, it's also mm. worse for performance as well mm. which is where that tie in between a program that deals with tissue quality and robustness mm. will also deal with performance at yeah, the same time yeah. it's pretty cool uh tissue quality i think we should talk about the forgotten stepchild of soft tissues calves calves let's, yeah. do, let's do that quickly because we've now spent uh, like 15 minutes on just tissue quality <laughs> we haven't touched on conditioning or strength no, or no, power no, yet yeah, so. Yeah. so very quickly um when you're at the uh, afl um summit that you went to a couple of years ago remember that you are they were talking about they talked in depth about uh, oh, yes. hamstrings yeah the, a, the afl grand final symposium two years ago i got to say andrew russell speak which yeah was and latrobe does a uh, an injury so, so andrew russell for those who don't know one, one of the best high performance managers in the AFL, if not the best. Of all time, yeah. He's, he's brilliant. Um, and he's just gone from Hawthorne to Carlton. to Carlton. So that'll be very interesting because my question has always been how much of Hawthorne's dominance um, is about Alistair Clarkson and how much of it is about um, Andrew Russell? And it'll be interesting to see the experiment. I think, though, it won't be true because what you'll see is that um, the person directly, I'm not sure who it is actually, who was directly um, being mentored by Andrew Russell is going to step in. Is this so, going to be Andrew Russell, you know, the second? 2.0 in, in, in a sense. So I think Hawthorne's going to go. Just fine. Probably be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's not no. like they're going to forget all the things he said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's gone. We don't know <laughs> really those things what, anymore. What do we do? Um, but yeah, talking about the, the so, calves, it was, it was pretty funny. I reckon it was great. So Latrobe do an injury report and an injury synopsis of, of all the stuff that happened yeah. last year. So it was like quad tears and ACLs and concussions, and they started talking about AFL women's because it was mm-hmm. just after AFL women's had started, and then they talk about hamstrings and you know rates are going down and it's because of this, and we're now linking it to that and mm-hmm. talked about Nordics and stuff, and then they went oh and calves. They happen. We're not sure why. <laughs> that was basically it. It was just this. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, this is the incident rate. This is the prevalence. Yeah. More likely in older athletes. More likely in Salas, I think it was, than gastroc. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's all we got. Significantly more likely in Salas, apparently. Yeah. yeah. And um, um, much more likely if you're 26 or 25 plus or 27. Like it's it happens. In, it's an old man injury, as they mm, call it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with Salas, it's it's interesting that it 
actually absorbs significantly more of the brunt of the force when you're when you're running. Mm. Um, when we talk about that six times eight, six to eight times body weight and ground reaction forces, mm. that's what they're talking about. Slice there, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, uh, what can you do about it? Seated calves, seated calves, standing calves. Yeah. Um, All of our footy players do seated and standing because we just want to give. Uh, insurance on that yeah and we chase time and attention with more reps mm. but then also once they're competent with the reps we start chasing load mm. weight vests up to body weight even mm. past body weight mm. on the seated yeah. calf as build well. build strong calves both both in standing and seated so yeah. you're getting gastroc the um the one that pokes out but uh so the ones underneath the, as well the deep guy right mm. next to your achilles all yeah. right so i've talked we talked this is my bad way too long about tissue quality let's talk about actual um uh avo- so we do have to talk a tiny bit more about the injury stuff and then we'll lead into more performance. ACL prevention. Yeah, ACLs are huge. And they're yeah. going to get bigger. Yeah. Unfortunately, before they get better. We're yeah. not yet at the darkest point. No, I think we're going to see see more and more. I think you'll you'll be able to judge the ACL. So the, the moment we are seeing um, women uh, doing their ACL a little bit more in, in the sport, girls are a little bit more. Uh, eight to nine times more. Is e- that, even when adjusted for length of season. Is that, is that how it's but, panning out? That's why I saw something the other day. They're saying mm. eight, even up to nine times yeah, little, as, like, as, as often for minutes played. And, things and like it'll, that. Get, it'll get better, but I think people um, people shouldn't be too optimistic. I'm normally a bit of an optimist. Um, but if you look at, at basketball, where basketball is a fairly uh, gender equal sport. The girls yep. start, start at the same time as boys and they've been playing for a long time. It's still, depending on what stats you read, between four and eight times more likely if you're a girl to require an, uh, an ACL Rico than a guy. Um, and we won't really see those stats till kids like my daughter who started Auskick as a five-year-old last year. Um, it's not till she is, you know, in her 20s that the stats will really start, will start to get a sense of, oh, okay, if, if we start them all off at the same age, where do the ACLs fall in terms of that? Because mm. um, the girls, the female footballs aren't coming from a level playing ground. No. They're, they're coming from a background of having not played footy or not played as much footy or different sports, yeah. different backgrounds. So they're doing completely different movement skills, different rules, different conditioning situations. They're just not used to it. Just yeah. not used to the sport the same way mm. guys are who play from, you know, kick all the way through tack yeah. cup and onwards. So. Yeah. Um, but what – so that's that's the big mystery of, of how when the dust settles in 20 years from now. <laughs> Two decades. How, how, how high – what, what I'm very confident is it will still be alarmingly high and so what we should do is right now is do everything we can to prevent them. Uh, and so that is movement skill. Is that strength as an underpinning? So can you squat? Can you hinge? Do you have strong glutes? Strong hamstrings. Uh, and then it's movement skill. Can you land nicely? Can you can you cut nicely? Um, do you have good running technique? Because I think people often forget that your running technique, if you run poorly, uh, particularly with uh, if you're a puller, if you're pulling through with the hamstrings. So a heel striker typically? A heel striker. Um, rather than a pusher where you're pushing through with the glutes. Well, the hamstring, which is the anchor for your ACL, is now fatigued when you're playing and therefore less likely to anchor nicely for your ACL. So I think it, it all it, it all ties in. It does. Um, so, yeah, movement skill. So fo- an early focus on moving in, in a nice stacked way where the joints are just stacked on top of each other rather than caved in um, and learning to cut early. Mm. What have we done on that? Uh, well, we've got our warm-up 2.0. Which yeah, is a brilliant that's... resource for mm. all sports and all athletes to be using just to generally, you know, mm. loosen off, strengthen up, activate everything, put the body in good alignment, and then practice those movement skills before yep. every game. Uh, as far as agility stuff, I want to do um, a football specific one. I think I think I need to do yeah, one. just want, just tweak it a little bit, just tweak it a little bit, put a bit of a neural stretch in, a couple of little bits and pieces. Yeah, yeah. Um, coming soon. We'll, we'll work on that. We'll make yeah. a, a footy specific warm up. I like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so attend to your movement skill. Uh, and that's uh, that's fun stuff, and I think the kids can get into that pretty easily. Yep. And um, you can incorporate that into your sports stuff. It doesn't have to just be mm. straight line stuff. You can incorporate a mm. ball. You can incorporate a footy. You can add in you know mm. more engaging components mm. of that as well, especially for younger kids who yep. you might not have the attention span. So if you've built this athlete, you've built this robust athlete with, um, you've attended to their strength, that they're able to squat decent weights. Uh, they've got they've progressed along the Nordic continuum um, and. Copenhagen's, uh, you've got pretty good movement skill. Then you really are now starting to look at uh, fitness. Well, we're at 20 plus minutes now. Should we maybe turn this into a two-parter mm. and put performance in its own category maybe in, in a couple of weeks' time? That's probably a good idea. 
I think because uh, what I was thinking of while we're on the topic of injuries and we mm. touched on ACLs and, that, and all these, you know, ACLs deserve about five episodes of its own at some right. point. Let's do that. But maybe to wrap up today, we could just talk quickly about concussion. Mm. Can we, if we're partitioning it that way, which I like, let's yep. do that. Uh, could we talk about shoulders and concussion? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay, two, cool. two more interviews. So we've covered uh, hamstrings, so, adductors so and groins. Bulletproofing against soft tissues, bulletproofing against ACL. Um, now let's move up a bit. Let's move up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so with footy, with, with the overhead marking and the um, constant collisions and tackles, uh, shoulder stability is a really big deal. Yep. Um, if you were the engineer that made the shoulder, you would get the sack because yeah. it, it's a terrible joint. Poorly uh, designed, terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it does need structural upgrades. It needs to be made made yeah. better. And needs to have active stability because while the hip has a lot of passive structure holding mm. together as a ball mm. and socket, the shoulder is very much out there dependent on your muscular and your mm. postural considerations to keep it in place. Yeah. Um, and I think the best, the, the big rock for that is um, really nicely executed chins. Not the ugly, I, I'm not strong enough, so I have to um, kind of hunch over chins. Because curl with your bicep. Because I think they give you almost no benefit. Um, but a nice, strict, mostly it's going to start with an assisted chin where you're actually in the same position you would be in uh, reaching up to mark. So that's the overhead marking, overhand version of a chin-up, which some people call a pull-up as yeah. opposed to a chin-up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so doing that with a nice initiation, like a nice depression uh, and we've got a video of that from We do have a video about forever ago. reverse shrugs, another one from Young Durham. Uh, <laughs> pulling out the archives for this episode. <laughs> um, but I think that's uh, that's there's massive bang for buck there because you're going to be stronger overhead yep. and you're going to be able to stabilize uh, that shoulder joint. And the shoulder under, blade will work with the arm to create that stability. That's yep. what you want with that reverse shrug idea. Yeah. And eventually you'll get a, also like in the, in the short term, your chins will suck and go back and you'll feel weak. Because you can't do the crappy chin anymore. That's if you're moving from that cheating, ugly version to a strict so, form. So yep. a nice one. Uh, but in the long term, you end up with a much, much stronger. Yeah. Um, because you can actually execute it for the purpose. Because because the cheaty, the cheaty, hunchy one, um, it's... For it's, lack of a better term. Yeah. <laughs> These are scientific terms now, people. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, it's pretty pecky. Pecky and bicepy. Yeah. And they're yeah. actually neither of those... Muscles are particularly helpful in that situation. No. Yeah, we want we want lower traps, we want lats, we want rotator cuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah, uh, because we, we get and the thing is, before someone says, "What about the pecs? They're great." The pecs they get so much love. No one that goes to the gym doesn't give <laughs> no. plenty of love to, to their pushing. And no one's not doing their push ups and bench press. That's <laughs> yeah. fine. It'll be it'll be good. It'll be it'll be taken care of. Um, yeah. So if you, I think that, that and plus rowing, like horizontal. Horizontal and vertical pull together, yeah. for sure. So you build that athlete has a really strong, robust um, shoulder, um, shoulder complex, I suppose. Yep. Um, and now we're up to concussions. <laughs> concussions to wrap it up. Let's from from mm. knees all the way up to mm. the head. Mm. Oh God, ankles. Um, do the uh, Jacob's anti ankle rolling workout. That video. Yep, I've got a whole video <laughs> and a whole article on ankles. Go watch that. Ankle rolls are very preventable. Uh, if you put in the right work, you can avoid them. So basketball is a high ankle rolling, yep. uh, high frequency court sports in general. More so than um, grass sports. Putting in the uh, the proprioceptive stuff. We once with the Boomers went an entire season without a single player missing a single game to any injury, and that included rolled ankles. That's pretty cool. And that's pretty cool. And I just think it was we got a little lucky, um, and uh, but we also the work they were, in. They were doing we all those things from that that from warm up day one. Exercise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the ankles. So there's a whole video about it. They're important. Um, bulletproof them too. Okay, so from ankles up to head, <laughs> concussions. A concussion is still in a point where we are still learning yeah. how big of a deal it is. Mm. And it's definitely, I think, in the, you know, we talked about hamstrings being the last five years, mm. even the last three years, yeah. two years with concussions, it's really starting to be like, wow, it's a big deal. We're going to look back on the on this period as the, one day we'll look back on um, this as the as the dark age, we're like, whoa, I can't believe how what much we, did. we didn't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's so interesting. Um, the big thing I think that we're not realizing is that recovery from it is important mm. and that just because you can't see the injury mm. doesn't mean it's not affecting your function and doesn't mean pushing through that is going to slow your recovery. Let's, um, let's talk about your concussions. My <laughs> concussions... <laughs> Do you want me to talk about the two incidents? Yeah, I do. And, and yeah. then you can talk about my symptoms because I was being yeah. concussed. wasn't very aware of them. <laughs> so, three years ago? Four yeah. years ago? Ages ago. Yeah. I was playing pickup basketball 
mm. uh, with some friends on a low hoop, <laughs> as as young boys will do. And I was playing with my mate, who's quite a good point guard, and I was playing close to the ring. And I, I pointed up to the you know the ring, which is like eight and a half, nine foot, or it was, <laughs> and set up, and I, I cut baseline, I went around for the alley oop, and I just went thunk. <laughs> You like you just jumped jumped straight into my the black, head backboard. went straight into the backboard right across my forehead, <laughs> so I had this line like like a Harry Potter scar like yeah. this, this graze mark from the thing, and I momentarily blacked out and yeah. like I hit hit the board hard and I remember holy hell that hurt because that's then, some velocity like that's a yeah, I was going up to hammer on someone I was and, and dunk how, that <laughs> and how much do you weigh. At the time, I was heavy. I would have been like 95 kilos. I'd love to work out the actual uh, the physics geez, of it. The yeah. geez, because a 95 kilo. And traveling at peak velocity. Three and a half, four meters per second, something like that. Just And because the backboard was so low, it wasn't like I had a 40-inch vert. I wasn't mm. slowing down. I was mm. just off the ground when I hit it. Yes, yeah, so that's like being whacked with a, like a proper... It's like being whacked with a proper sledgehammer. Yeah, it hurt. <laughs> and so I blacked out uh, like for two seconds, one yep. second. Woke up on the ground, seeing stars, uh, and I was out mm. for... Yeah, it was not a very comfortable day. No. And this is before I knew much of this stuff about concussion, before yeah. we did our episode on concussions mm. a while ago. Yeah. I'll talk, do you want me to talk about my second one? And we can talk about yeah, okay. what's going yeah. on here. So my second one was <laughs> six months later, 10 I'm, months later. I'm still angry about this one. Not long enough later that it, I should be as cavalier as I am about now. <laughs> it was quite a funny story though. So playing golf with my friends, not a good start to a story. Playing golf with my friends, a different group of friends this time. Uh, we're playing along on the seventh hole or whatever, and uh, we're all on the green. I was on the green first, so I was sitting there waiting for everyone to chip mm. on. And uh, I have two friends, Tom, and so Tom was down to my right, and the other Tom, I was watching him because mm. I thought he was hitting. And the next thing, someone yells heads, and the first Tom, who was close to me, has mm. hit the best shot of his life, the best chip shot of his life. It goes up twenty meters in the air, and just floats, and I'm sitting next to the tee, and it just goes straight on top of my head. Onto your temple or top uh, of your head? No, more sort of top, top? top of the frontal lobe, sort of yeah. motor cortex area for <laughs> those who are familiar with the head. And same thing, I was down. And you went down like a sack of potatoes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Not quite. I sort of slumped no. my knees, they said. Right. And then I went down right. on my bum. So I sort of like slumped into that sort of yeah. exhausted pose yeah, right. and into the ground. Massive egg, blood sort of trickling yeah. down my head. Uh, and then they took me to the hospital. Uh, and that one, I was pretty out of it mm. for a few days. mm, mm. So I don't remember much about those days. I remember being very bored. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you were in both incidents. Um, you know, you were pretty fuzzy. Like you're very. You've got a. You've got a sharp brain. Um, and yeah, you were. You were just fuzzy. It was like um, you're a bit sleepy. You know, I've learned that they talk about punch drunk, don't they? Yeah, you know, you, you were just not quite uh, yourself. Just a little bit slow on the uptake. Yeah, and I don't remember much of that. Mm. I remember having a headache for a day or two after the second one, uh, and you made me take a week off work, which is a brilliant choice. Mm. Uh, and I spent the first two days basically doing nothing, just sitting at home, mm. watching very, very easy to digest TV. Mm. Uh, and then I don't remember being fuzzy the next week after that. But you said it took a, a little while for well, me to get right. Yeah, I think you were fuzzy for. I think there were two phases. You were fuzzy for a while, and then you were just. Um, you're a bit sort of grumpy and impatient for a while afterwards as well. Mm. I reckon there was probably about four months where you really? weren't, yeah, you weren't quite yourself. Um, you, you know, cause you are, um, an, an ambitious, impatient person in a good way. <laughs> like you want to get stuff done. Yep. Um, like, you know, the necessity is the mother invent of invention, like frustration you know people invented the wheel because they were frustrated with carrying stuff like that's mm. that's fine um but it just had a bit of an edge to it for a while where you just weren't quite uh, normally you're like like really driven but with um uh, a fair bit of the laughing not you so just, much with the laughing you, no no you just weren't quite yourself yeah, okay yeah interesting uh, and it took a while for that to come and of course the thing is you can't say to someone hey you're being a bit grumpy um, and have them react that well to it either. So it's kind of <laughs> Probably because that concussion you don't remember from three months ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so so the effects of concussion are profound. Yep. And um, they can be long lasting, yep. especially when you have two within 12 months. Yep. And more and more, we're now seeing people who have had multiple ones who have just been told, you're done, you're, you're, you're out. We saw last year a few women from the VFL, and Ali was telling us about some stories mm. about some athletes who were like, I'm done. I'm sorry, girls. I can't keep playing if mm. I have you know three serious concussions in eighteen months. That's mm. Mm. like you keep going. That the next because because each concussion has a longer recovery period, has more effect on the brain, and has mm. more chance of something catastrophic 
mm. you know, bleeding on the brain, hemorrhaging mm. and memory loss and mm. amnesia and things like that. A lot and of stuff. Things like that. And then the other thing, you know, beyond the short term, so I think is we don't know what's going on long term. No. We have no idea what's going on with chronic traumatic encephalopathy and CTE yeah. and all these these long term things that are making people kill themselves and yeah. have serious mental issues serious later in issues. life. I mean, massive problem in gridiron. Like it's it's we, we're never going to rival American football for it because yeah. they use the head as a battering ram. Yeah. And, um, and I think actually on that, a gold star of the AFL over the last five years and probably yeah, maybe even ten years now. Yeah. For They've been ahead of the curve, changing the rules, and everyone's like, oh, you know, the, the, the game's game. not the same. It's not the same. Time. It's like. Yeah, but our players are going to be able to have long-lasting careers, happy lives, yeah. and be able to function in society yeah, because, post the sport. Because they had the, the priority of protect the head. That was yeah. that was the thing that came in really early. Um, and so what's interesting is then at the moment, I just saw last week this awesome technology, which is a Bluetooth-based uh, accelerometer microchip that goes in your mouth guard. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, I think I've heard of these. I didn't know they were yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah, it's Oh, and I just looked at it. I was like, "That's brilliant!" Because, because the way it's locked into your teeth in in your in your skull, it's actually able to give you a very direct reflection of the impact of the, the G head. forces. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so then they they can actually start tracking the G forces and being able to use that as I will, I will be able to say everyone's going to vary in terms of how their bodies adapt and deal with forces, but at least now having a number for the intensity of your knocks, I think, is going to be really interesting. Cause and I think four teams in the AFL are going to be using them this year. That's awesome. That's yeah. so cool. Because yeah. that's that's the thing with it. Like a harder knock is obviously worse. But if I take, you know, two Gs of a force mm. and you take two Gs, our brains are going to respond completely mm. differently from a and symptoms point of view, from a how long it takes to recover. Everything's going to be varied. So that's, they don't know how to categorize yeah. those things. And the cumulative thing, I think, will be really mm. interesting as well. Um, so that's all. The, that's, that's the... Um, Terrifying news. Um, uh, the good, not the good news. The there's not that the much silver lining. Okay, so how do, okay, with regard to concussion, I think you are less likely to be concussed if you are um, in good body positions. If you're able to get in and get out and get the ball, I think you're going to be you're going to be safer. Yep. Uh, if you have great movement skill and awareness, you're now less likely to be cleaned up. So all the all the other things you did uh, for performance, which we'll talk more about next week, those things directly impact. Um, but the big one that you can do is, if it does happen, is managing well. Because we still get, you know, I mean, it's happened it happened multiple times last year where a kid would come in and say, "I got concussed today," um, uh, and not even say, "Can I lift?" I'd be like, "Oh yeah, I got concussed. I'm feeling a bit sick. I've got a bit of a headache, um, but I'm going to lift, right?" Or mid workout, they'll tell you. I mentioned in passing, yeah. yeah, as they're about to start their first or second set. And and the parents' attitude is sometimes still a bit kind of like, oh well, you know, yeah, I had plenty in my day, it's fine. Mm. and maybe you didn't, maybe you're fine, but not everyone's going to react that same way. Um, and when it's your brain, it's just that's such a risky call to make. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like if you if like I broke my wrist last year, um, and it's all fine now. But if it wasn't, that's okay. <laughs> You know, it's a risk. I can I can get around having a, a you might not be able to do push ups, but the rest will be fine. Yeah, yeah or it's brain. Yeah. Um, mm. So I think that's the big thing is is uh, try and avoid it by um, moving well, being strong, being agile, being situationally aware, and learning to tackle learning and learning to, tackle. to be tackled is part yeah. of that as well. So learning how to brace, learning how to take impact, learning how to give impact, and not mm. you know bounce off yourself. Those mm. those are skills. Um, that I think can really be easily improved. Yeah, and they're footy skill, footy yep. coach areas, but yep. they're, they're ones that can be focused on. Uh, and then do the right thing if it does happen. Yeah. Whew. So many things. That's that's why we love footy. There's so many things. That we've, we're 38 minutes in and we've just... And we talk about injuries and, and <laughs> tissue quality. So yeah. I suppose this one then becomes AFL part one, tissue quality and injury prevention. Yeah. I suppose is the, the working mm. title for this one. I guess so. And the next one, the interesting thing was, is we'll, we'll end up circling back a lot in the performance thing. To the things that we're chasing for performance also happen to increase your bulletproofness. Yeah, it's not one or the other. You can it's have both. Two sides of the same coin. Mm. Mm. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Plenty of resources for this one. <laughs> oh, they, will, they will all be linked in the blog article that goes with this yep. or uh, the resources section. So yep. browse that, uh, check it out, take it to your footy coach and see if you can start implementing it for your team as well. Mm. Great.